Hello, I'm Laura Thompson, VP of Platform Engineering at Fastly, and welcome to the fireside chat about how to build and deploy services in the cloud. Today, I'm here with Sean McCullough from Atlassian. Hello, everyone. Okay, so I actually really like the format of this session because you know I can talk about deployment all day, um, and it's a pleasure to talk to somebody new about it. Um, so we have a few things to talk about, and first of all, I want to talk about how you choose the right patterns for deployment. So, Sean, when you set out to deploy something new to the cloud, you make a series of decisions about you know what patterns to follow and how to go about it. So, what do you see as the common patterns there, and how should teams make decisions about which way to go? Yeah, I think it's good to kind of start with the second part of that question as, as a framework to approach this. Um, the way that you choose these patterns is really important. And I think that there's um, one reality, which is every organization is a little bit different. Your culture is different. Your tool chain is different. And I think that you should create practices that match your organization. I think that uh, a lot of times people look at, you know, Google or Facebook or these big companies who have very complicated practices and they're like, why can't I just bring that into my org? And that's just not realistic. So just be pragmatic uh, and also be incremental, right? Once you get some foundation with some good practices, you can increment, you can increase them over time. Um, second, you know, I think it's uh, really good to think about it in terms of a, a rough framework, but allow teams some flexibility within that. Um, and I think a really good example of this would be whether you want to do kind of uh, a manual or scheduled release pattern versus continuous deployment. Uh, I think some teams are very capable of doing continuous deployment. And I think that's really easy if you're starting with something new. But if you're kind of a legacy shop or you have some other services that you're trying to improve the deployment methodology around, um, going right into continuous deployment might be just too much work or too uh, scary for teams to take on all at once. Um, so I think in terms of what those practices are that, that are really important, uh, I would start off by just saying, first, you have to make an investment in whatever you decide to do. Um, I think it's very often, I think deployment infrastructure is often very unloved in companies. And I think it's something that requires a, a real dedication of time from engineers and leaders to really make real inside of your organization. Um, you know, I think that more often than not, this tends to be reactive, right? So teams tend to think about their deployment practices when their deployments start to go wrong. Uh, you know, we've had a bunch of incidents related to deployments or change management issues, things like that. And then you're like, all right, now it's time to go like do something about this. And, and maybe that's the impetus that it is for you. Uh, and then sometimes the natural consequence of that is, all right, let's get a tiger team of four engineers together for two months and like just, you know, kind of fix a couple of things and then we'll kind of go back uh, to our normal business. Um, maybe, you know, having a team of 10 engineers forever isn't, you know, the appropriate skill for you. But I think making sure that there are a couple of engineers in, and a leader inside of your organization who take this on as a responsibility um, and that they're carrying um, this responsibility on you know, year after year. Um, I think it's always a good thing to maybe uh, start by setting some metrics, right? So whatever your practice wants to be, I think measuring your uh, deployment pipeline is a really great way to get started. Uh, and it helps you set like quantifiable goals. Um, so I think a couple of key metrics would be like, how many times a day are you deploying? Uh, how, how long does your deployment take? That's just the mechanics of like, I said that I wanted to deploy to 100% of my servers are, are serving production traffic on the new code. And then I think a more complicated one is lead time. When a developer starts work, what is the lead time from that work to merge pull request to, uh, to production? I think if you start with those three metrics, you have a really good foundation for thinking about where you want to invest. Um, and then I think some of the, the um, other big practices that are important uh, when you're choosing the kind of right patterns are um, some level of standardization, right? So I think in companies, you tend to see sometimes a mix of like Bamboo, Jenkins, GitHub Actions, Bitbucket Pipelines, pick one. Uh, economies of scale really, really help. Um, I've often found that, you know, uh, one team has a great idea, but they've implemented it in some tool that my team doesn't use. And then it's like, oh, that's a great idea, but it's going to take us another 10 hours to go figure out how to do that or whatever. Uh, and having some standardization like that really helps. Yeah, I think you're right, especially about the measurements. I really like that last one that you mentioned, sort of the, the latency from the developer's brain until it's running in production. I think it's super important. Um, one of the things I want to pick up on that you said early was 
you talked about how different speeds of deployments are right for different companies, right? Some might use a train model where they ship, you know, every Tuesday or Wednesday and some are on continuous deployment. Um, it's always been my thought that you should build all the tooling you need for continuous deployment, even if you're not going to deploy continuously. And one of the big requirements there is around testing, like having really good test coverage and faith in your tests. So that really leads me into sort of our next topic, which is how you test your services. So when you're going to ship something for the first time, um, obviously you need to test it. And every time you ship it, you're going to need to test it. So what advice do you have for developers who are setting off on that process? How do you begin testing? How do you make it scale? Yeah. So just like what I said with deployment practices, I'd repeat, invest in your testing infrastructure. Uh, again, this tends to be a very unloved part mm -hmm. of an engineering team's culture. Um, and you know, very often, the people who own your deployment pipeline can also be the people who pitch in to help maintain your testing infrastructure. And this isn't you know, what testing frameworks you use or anything like that. It's you know, which servers are, like what CI environment are you actually using? Are you Jenkins, Bitbucket Pipeline, something like that. Uh, but then I think there's a kind of broader set of infrastructure around that that's really useful. So do you have a um, code coverage tool? Uh, where are those reports going? Who's looking at those reports? Is there a dashboard that you can use to at easily see the data coming out of them? Um, so spend some time there. Um, I think, again, also like deployment uh, practices, you know, the, the, the tools are really important, but the practices are even more important than which tools you actually decide to pick. Um, so I think, you know, it's been kind of common knowledge in the industry for a while that you want to have a really good standard uh, testing pyramid. Uh, you know, if you use test-driven development to like make sure that that's part of your practices. But I think, especially when it comes to deploying services, I think that there's a new level of testing that's uh, kind of growing in popularity, which is like a, an, a live integration test or a post-deployment verification test or a, uh, a kind of deployment integration test suite that blocks rollout or production or something that you use in a like kind of gradual rollout, right? Um, you can think of these as your kind of old school production test, like you spin up Selenium or something like that and run it against the website. But as opposed to running it in a like a dummy or test environment, you'd actually run it against your production services. And you'd want to be able to run them against a development environment or anything like that. Um, I think you know, this practice isn't new, but I actually think the tooling around this has really uh, evolved in the last few years. Uh, I know in Bitbucket, we made a massive in investment in moving to Cypress, which is like a new headless browser environment. It has really uh, awesome like uh, debugging tools and a developer dashboard. You can like actually like get videos and step through like the execution stack of it. You can like inspect variables at different parts of it. Really, really powerful stuff. And I think that tooling is a really valuable thing to do, especially if you want to get to continuous delivery. That basically gives you some level of assurances that from the time that you run your branch builds to the time, you know, to every 15 minutes or every half hour in production, you're constantly running those tests. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a really powerful part of those tests too is that it's not just testing your application. I think as we move into like, more distributed environments, those tests can be your canary in the coal mine for incidents, right? Mm -hmm. There, Before a customer reports to you, and I think this is something that we're finding more and more true at Atlassian, our PDVs will fail or our regular mm -hmm. kind of uh, integration tests in production will fail, and then we can go jump on our problem. So I think that's a really good, like valuable part of your testing pyramid that's kind of new to the industry in the last few years. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. it's a kind of a continuum between testing and deployment, uh, testing and monitoring, right? Um, yeah. And at what point your tests end and your monitoring and production begin? And the answer is, I think they should be somewhat overlapping. I actually yeah. want to ask you a related question on that, which is, uh, imagine that you are coming in as an engineer to work on some legacy code uh, that's already in production and it doesn't have a lot of tests. So how do you, how would you even start? It's pretty common. Yeah. So, you know, I think there's a couple of different approaches to it, right? I think that there's the kind of unit-based testing approach, which is really good. Like, you know, just kind of as you're crawling through pieces of the code, and, and I think this is usually organized around a project, right? You don't inherit a legacy code base to just, you know, sit and watch it. Usually you inherit right. it because you have a job to do in that code base. So you just kind of start, yeah. So you start with the testing around the job that you need to do, you know, test out your kind of your beans, your classes, like the kind of high level things that you can kind of wrangle in unit testing. And that might in and of itself kick off a bunch of refactoring, which might kind of bring other unit tests or other kinds of functional tests into play. But then I think the other part of it that's really valuable would be, 
you know, that kind of integration testing suite. So just as a user in a browser or as a consumer of an API, can you, you know, can you kind of establish what the normal behavior of this thing would be and start to document that over time through your testing suite? Um, one of the things that I think is actually really valuable when inheriting a legacy code base is visual regression testing. Uh, this is something that I think has gotten much more popular in the last few years. Um, I don't know if, you know, to speaking to the front end developers out there, but I think we've gotten spoiled by a very, very good and mature tool chain now. But if you're inheriting a legacy code base from, you know, four or five years ago, maybe like the, you know, you're using an old CSS framework or something like that. And it's very easy to introduce those like annoying little regressions into your UI that make a might take a while to suss out. So visual regression testing is very, very useful there. Um, and then I think another like useful approach towards testing in this environment is what we like in the last thing we call it blitz testing, um, but mm -hmm. basically just like getting a manual testing guide together. Um, and I think that this is a good practice. It's a, really a result of like a user journey mapping, right? So if you're building something new, you build out a user journey. As a user, I wanna go to the screen, I wanna click these things and yada, yada, yada. Well, you can create a, like a kind of manual validation test suite that's based off of the user journeys that you're kind of looking to modify as part of that legacy code base. Right. And it, it, one, it helps you really understand the product better. What are the flows in the product? What are the things that people are going to actually be using in here? And two, it helps you start think about the variance uh, of those different experiences. Um, I think very often, you know, developers tend to, you know, very uh, logically focus on the happy path of the job that they're trying to get right. done. But I think when you kind of use that kind of manual testing framework, it's it's not a very efficient thing. You don't want to do this, you know as a release blocker for every release, but I think it's a really good practice to get you more familiar with the surface area of the thing that you're looking to maintain. Great. Okay, so you're at the stage where you've chosen your approach to deployment and you've got pretty good test coverage, you're happy with what you have, and you're actually setting out to deploy. So what strategies should you use to make your deployments, first of all, successful, second of all, safe, and third of all, low stress for everyone involved? Yeah. So I think when talking about successful deployments, the, I think the, there are two things that are really valuable. Um, one is if you can move towards immutable infrastructure, that's going to make your life a lot easier. Um, you know, I think if you're in AWS or any other cloud provider, it's very easy to just go spin up a whole set of new instances off to the side and then slowly migrate your traffic over. Um, anytime that you're in the situation of having to mutate code on a production server, the complexity of what you're trying to solve for is just going to be through the roof. Yeah. Um, and then the second part is get really uh, get comfortable of being able to run a very fast rollback. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's it's often I think that there was kind of a prevailing sentiment in the industry a couple of years ago that you should never roll back. You should always yeah. roll forward. Always fail forward. Yeah. 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 And. Yeah. I think that there's value to that in a very sophisticated and mature deployment practice, right? You find the problem, you fix it really quick and you get it out. But I think being able to roll back with utter confidence is such a powerful tool to have, right? It's that thing that, you know, if something breaks, you know, maybe five hours after the deploy, right? Like maybe a slow growing memory leak happened or mm -hmm. some other, you know, when peak traffic hit, you actually notice a change in behavior that caused a regression, something like that. Be able to just like push the big red button, have a whole thing roll back to a known good state is just, it relieves anxiety and stress through the team. And it gives you just like a really awesome tool in your arsenal. Now, if you take that and you can, can kind of combine it with like a more advanced tool chain, like the testing that we just mm -hmm. talked about, you can actually wire all of that together, right? You can have immutable infrastructure so that, you know, when you want to roll out new code, it goes out to new servers. You can validate it on those new servers before you're like any of your customers actually see that traffic. You can gradually cut over and monitor it over time. And if you're uncomfortable, you can very quickly roll back. And the best kind of rollback is one where you just move from, you know, one existing set of infrastructure to another, right? You don't have to, you just tell your load balancer to move from A to B. And it doesn't take, it takes barely any time to go do that. Uh, and I think that's a really like awesome way of approaching like a minimum viable, like a sophisticated deployment pipeline. Yeah, very much yeah, so. Very and, much I so. and I think that's sort of the basis, basis of people when they talk about, you know, cattle not pets. Um, um, and I like to know like that when you do when serverless deployments in the cloud, as it being uh, bees, right? Because they work a bees. That's sort of a yeah. single function. So, yeah, that's cool. Okay. Um, 
so we've talked about a bunch of things like deployment approaches, testing, what you do on the actual day. What are the, what are the things you want people to walk away from this session from? What are the things you want to say, oh, wow, Sean talked about this thing and I thought that was really insightful. So tell me, tell me your deepest insights. Well, I would say, especially to all of your engineering leaders out there, invest in the tooling teams. Like that's, I think the biggest takeaway, you're not going, you're not going to see improvements in this until you put time, energy, and money into solving the problem. And it's something that is going to save you so much time, energy, and money in the future. It removes so much uncertainty by just kind of knowing that that foundation's there. And I think it's, you know, you might spend more upfront, but it becomes an incremental uh, cost over time. And I think it's something that's, um, that will make every head of engineering or engineering managers just more confident in their ability to get things out the door. Um, second is don't try to shoot for the stars. Find the first improvement that you can make, make that improvement in your organization, let it sing for a while, and then think about how you want to improve upon it. I, I do think that there is something valuable to what you said about aiming your infrastructure towards continuous deployment, right? Like I think it's very good to have a North Star and a clear articulation of where you want to be at some point in the future, but you do not need to get there on your first iteration of your deployment infrastructure. Um, and then second, I think take all of the practices that we've learned about testing on the kind of build cycle, build and development cycle of your code and apply them to production infrastructure. You're gonna get a lot of value if you can run tests in production infrastructure. And I think that this becomes increasingly useful as we have distributed architectures. Um, you know, when you're dealing when you're dealing with code in a monolith, it can be very easy to do a bunch of unit and functional testing to make sure that it all fits together. But when you get a failure in a distributed infrastructure, it can be very hard to identify it and to diagnose it. And having those kind of tests that are constantly running against your production infrastructure, one, give you the confidence that the things that you write are continuing to work over time, but two, give you that really awesome early warning signal to something breaking in that infrastructure that will require your attention. And the best outcome is that you can get to it before your customers even notice. Yep, I think you're really right. You're really right. It's super important, super important to, on your deployment, on your deployment process. process. And I like, and I like about it as, as we don't we often don't have like product like management tools to internal tools. To internal tools. tools. I think that's incredibly important, yeah. right? Like you need to treat your deployment and testing pipeline as a product with a roadmap that iterates over time, you know, with each iteration being better than the past. And, you know, it's always better to leave something better than when you found it, right? You can write a test every day. You can improve the infrastructure every day. So every day is better than the one before and the deployment is calmer and everything goes better than it did the previous time. Yeah. Um, one one model that I found really useful for teams is to basically just set aside a tax for every sprint. So this is something that uh, a partner team or a sister team of Bitbucket did in the last one was every developer basically was taxed per sprint or really their manager was taxed. So they lost like one story point and they could figure out how they wanted to spend that task over time. But it basically meant over time, you accumulated some time that you needed to invest in this infrastructure. And sometimes it could be a one point story to write a test, but it could also aggregate to, you know, a five point story to like try out a new like UI testing library or something like that. And I think if you're just, if you, no matter how you organize it in your team, if you just set aside a little bit of time every week to make some progress, you're going to see really great results. Yeah, I like that you look at it as an investment, right? Because it's the compounding interest on the time you put in that pays off over time. So yeah, um, absolutely. What should I have asked you that I haven't asked you yet about deployment? Um, I think there's also, this is just a very fast changing environment. So, you know, should you jump on the next big thing right now? And I would say no, right? I, I think there are, um, Experimentation is really valuable to an organization. One, I think it keeps you agile. Like I think it keeps you looking for new things, but I think there's also organizational benefits. I think engineers and, and people just get excited to try new things. Um, but that doesn't mean just because, you know, uh, you know, your organization just got Kubernetes that you want to try like some complicated like Kubernetes deployment typologies in order to like, you know, <laughs> right. reduce your cost or your time to deploy by minutes, right? Like you, you want to weigh that investment over time. But also, I think it's really important to not go it alone. Um, I think we get a lot of value out of you know the ecosystem that we're operating in, and also the open source community. So when a concept comes out, you know you can decide whether it's a good fit for your organization to be an early adopter. But you know, follow along with it and wait be until it becomes a little bit more mature. 
I think a really good canary is when you start seeing companies write blog posts about how they've implemented that stuff inside of their organization. Like that's, you know, that's a kind of good signal that this is maybe maturing to the point where you're not going to be kind of, you know, walking through the jungle with a machete trying to figure out all the <laughs> things that you need to do in order to get this stuff stood up. Yeah. Uh, and I, this is speaking from experience. Like I adopted Node.js at like 0.4 a long mm -hmm. time ago and just the operational overhead of trying to, to use it was, it just took, a lot of energy away from the problem that we are trying to solve. Right, you only get so many innovation tokens, so you should spend them on something that matters, right? Exactly. We have a question from the audience, um, from Anne Schnabel. She would love to hear us chat more about the build part of build and deploy. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think that this is something where the kind of industry has uh, really changed a lot uh, in the last few years. I think Docker and OCI have really like changed the game about how you build your software. Um, you know, one of the things that we went through uh, at Atlassian is kind of moving away from these kind of reusable Linux environments where you know we'd have to pre-install a bunch of packages. There might be conflicts, or certain servers could build this thing, or certain servers could build that thing down to a model where Docker, we spun up a Docker container that had some of the dependencies ready to go and we built our artifacts inside of that thing and then we exported them. Now we're just doing the whole kind of runtime environment all in one using Docker or OCI. And that is so great. Um, I mean, you just, you get out of that dependency hell situation that you know all developers or operators have really had to deal with. Uh, but it's also really great if you can get to the point where you're shipping your libraries and all of your dependencies together as one unit. Um, I know, like you know, back in the old days when we used to have like kind of the the kind of pet servers. Like if you wanted, if there's a security vulnerability, which is I think a, a really interesting use case for this. Like just patching that thing can be so complicated because you don't know if you were that far behind or anything like that. With Docker, you can iterate on your infrastructure and your your environment just as fast as you iterate on the code base that you're you're working on. Uh, so I definitely. Uh, do that and then keep all of that stuff up to date. Um, I think um, in terms of build, there's a lot of great automation out there like uh, dependency upgraders and stuff like that that will automatically open up pull requests against your repositories to say, hey, I noticed a library is out of date and automatically go through and like ship that thing out. Um, the more that you can kind of iterate on the build side of it, just like you iterate in your software, the better your outcomes are gonna be. Thank you for that, Sean. It's been really lovely talking with you today, and I hope everybody enjoys uh, the rest of Postman Galaxy. Thanks. Great talking to you, Laura. Thanks, everyone.